Good morning and welcome to another edition of Mornings with Matthew. I'm Matthew Tregesser and joining me today is Fair's Julia Post. Nice to see you again, Julia. You too, Matthew. So for today's podcast, we have a special guest uh, from the Daily Caller News Foundation. His name is Jason Hopkins and he reports on immigration and energy. Uh, He's live with us now and Jason, welcome to FAIR. Welcome to the studio. Good to have you. Hey, thank you so much for having me on today. It's a pleasure. So for today, I want to begin with a segment called Capitol Hill Craziness. In this first segment, we'll talk about a quote or piece of legislation that a congressman recently said that we think is outrageous and needs to be addressed. Julia, can you uh, talk about AOC's quote that she recently said? So AOC tweeted last week, the far right loves to drum up fear and resistance to immigrants. But have you ever noticed they never talk about what's causing people to flee their homes in the first place? Perhaps that's because they'd be forced to confront one major factor fueling global migration, climate change. Right. So this was a very interesting tweet that AOC uh, made last week, and it got a lot of traction with conservatives and people uh, in Congress. I mean, obviously, there's a lot to deal with here. Jason, do you, what are your initial thoughts on this tweet? Do you think uh, she's right in saying this, or do you think it's just another thing where Democrats are, you know, basically tying in climate change for all the country's problems? Right. So this is a great way for AOC to link immigration with her her prize proposal, right? The Green New Deal, um, climate change, that's really been her thing since she's really come on the scene. Is there really any basis for this? Uh, there's not. I mean, to suggest that climate change is causing the migration crisis right now. I mean, if you notice that video that she linked to and anything she said has not really said anything specific. What exactly about climate change is causing uh, foreign nationals from the Northern Triangle to to leave? There's been talk before. I mean, this is actually something Al Gore has repeated in the past Mm -hmm. about um, a drought in Guatemala and kind of the Northern Triangle. But it's called the dry corridor in that region for, for a reason. I mean, the drought's been going on for a long time. This is really nothing new. Um, we had a very strong El Nino in 2015. That's also caused it. Uh, there's really no scientific link uh, to climate change and um, the drought in, in the Northern Triangle. So I just, I just don't see but it. What, what about her suggesting that basically, you know, every Central American works in agriculture or, you know, is working in some type of field that, you know, experienced a drought and now they have to flee their country. I mean, I I think that's kind of crazy to assume that every single person who lives in the Northern Triangle countries is an agricultural type of worker, don't you think? Right. And I'm if I'm not mistaken, the majority of them are, are citing violence for the reason that they're right. leaving. And um, GDP per capita in both uh, in all three countries have been steadily rising in the past few years. So, I mean, to suggest that it's a climate change issue, issue is really to suggest it's an economic issue, right? Saying it's a drought, mm-hmm. the farmers, they don't have jobs. But GDP per capita has been rising. So I think what stuck out to me, for, especially from the video that we haven't played, but the video went along with the tweet, and uh, she's talking about repaying our climate debts. And she's talking about America caused the climate change, caused these problems in these countries, therefore we need to open our borders and bring in everyone that's ever suffered any kind of repercussions from, from a drought or from El Nino or whatever. So I think what she's doing with bringing in the climate change is uh, you know, using it as a, as a catalyst for why we need open borders, why we need to bring everyone here. But I mean, when you look at like, that solution that she's providing, you know, that's not really going to help with uh, if she's blaming America for the climate problems in these other countries. She wants to bring in more people, possibly double the population in our country, only going to increase our Mm -hmm. own carbon footprint, which is only going to exacerbate the problems in these other countries. So I don't really see why she thinks that that's going to help anything. You can't bring everyone here. There's not enough room. Right. And who do you bring? Right. And if you think about it, you know, why isn't she calling out other countries like China or Brazil or Indonesia? I mean, she focuses, or at least the video focuses on, you know, Western nations, uh, and then you see in the text that the U.S. is highlighted in this big red type of color. Look, like it seems like we're the ones that are, you know, basically causing all of this. But you know, why why doesn't she call it other countries? Do you see any problem with that? Well, it's just pretty typical, and it's true. China, India, they're building new coal plants. I mean, essentially uh, every other month, every other week, there's a new coal plant that's being built. Uh, her proposal does not address this. It just targets the Western world, America specifically. But it really just kind of goes in line with her ideology, where it's basically the United States, it's Europe's fault for this, and so then we have to pay the price. Um, but Julie, as to your point, I mean, there's over a billion people in the world that are under uh, the poverty line. I mean, under her argument, are we expected to accept everyone in because this is our fault? It 
it doesn't make any practical sense. Right. I mean, are we responsible for a billion people moving here? And then what would the repercussions be on our own environment? You know, are we just going to take the national parks and turn them into housing complexes? Are we going right. our, our cities certainly couldn't handle an influx of what about our hospitals, our healthcare system, our schools, the, you know, public schools, inner cities that already don't have the resources that they need um, to serve the, to the people that are already in those communities. Um, when you're saying open the borders, is there a limit? Or is it just as many people as we can fit until our own country collapses? Well, think about going off of that. Think about the amount of consumption, you know, migration causes in a country. If, if you have millions of people migrating, even hundreds of thousands, they're consuming more, which is going to, you know, increase CO2 levels. Um, and it's just, I don't see how she thinks that by wanting to have more people come to the U.S., that's going to somehow drive down you know, CO2 emissions or drive down climate change. Right. I, I mean, like, especially because people coming to the border, I mean, Border Patrol agents are reporting that, you know, a lot of them are economic migrants. We talked about this. I mean, a lot of people are coming because, like they say, the American dream, you get a better life here, you make more money here, you get a better job more, and you can afford to maybe buy a car, buy an SUV, something that's going to produce more, you know, might buy a house that's going to produce, um, you know, emissions in that way, using electricity, using other water resources. So, Unless you're bringing these people here but and letting them come here, but telling them you can't have a better quality of life when you come here. You have to maintain the same emissions that you are maintaining in the country you came from. You're going to see an increase in the amount of energy being consumed here or being and the emissions being put out here. Well, Jason, here's a question going off of all this that I have for you. Why isn't AOC basically calling out these leaders in Central America of, of the Northern Triangle countries for mishandling their country's economies, for the corruption? This, in, in my mind, is one of the reasons why migrants are fleeing the Northern Triangle countries because the country's economies are basically tanked right now. And they want to come to the U.S. because Trump, President Trump has made the economy so well since he's taken over in office. I mean, why isn't she calling out these leaders in Central America? Well, if I can uh, uh, use a term here, I'd, because that's just simply not woke enough. <laughs> um, as a progressive, it would make sense to blame the United States um, for, for their problems. But you never have once heard her talk about MS-13, right. uh, the gang, huge gang violence in Central America. I mean, that's what's causing it. The, the, people are fleeing those countries because they're just simply unstable. Mm -hmm. unstable. And that's really what's causing it. And until some rule of law can be established in the Northern Triangle, this will continue. You know, it's funny, when we were down at the border in November, we had one, uh, an Uber driver, and she was, we were in San Diego, right? San Diego. Yeah, right. She was, she was Mexican-American. Uh, she was working as an Uber driver, but she had family in Mexico. And this was right when one of the uh, caravans was there. And she was saying to us that she didn't understand why these people were storming the American border. Why weren't they storming the capitals in their countries? She said if they really want change in their own countries, mm -hmm. they want uh, better opportunities, better economy, better uh, uh, quality of life for their, their people. Why are they coming here and storming the American border? Why aren't they going to their congressmen, their legislators, their presidents, whoever? Right. You know, why aren't they talking to their representatives and saying, hey, we want... We demand a better quality of life here in our own nation. I mean, that's a great point because, you know, you can migrate and, and flee your country for, I guess, as a short term so solution. But fact of the matter is eventually someone from the country is going to have to step up and, you know, try to bring social change or government change, regime change in these countries. And if you keep just running away from these problems, you're never going to solve them. And I think, you know, the U.S. could give aid or maybe have intervention, but those aren't really practical long-term solutions. I think the people of these countries really got to step up and say, hey, you know, let's take it back. Not to mention that the people that are going to be coming here are the ones that have a little bit of money. They can afford to make the journey. So the people who are coming from Guatemala and these Central American countries are not uh, the poorest of the poor. The poorest of the poor are going to stay where they are because they can't afford to move. And when that happens, and when all the, the people that have a little bit of money, a little bit of means that could start businesses there, that could help uh, with education, with healthcare, with all those things, and they all come here to our country, that leaves what's, you know, what's left behind in a pretty bad position. Those people aren't going to be able to build their own communities up because there'll be a massive brain drain. Mm -hmm. Is anyone that can afford to get out will if we open the doors. All right, so moving along to our next segment, uh, it's called Questions from the Nation. And so in this segment, uh, we have our taken questions from our social media followers, or sometimes we get emails from our followers. And 
Uh, we have a couple here today that we wanted to ask you, Jason, to see what your opinion on them were. Um, so we have Jason here. He's from Louisiana, and he says, quote, Immigration is like working offshore. You make better money and, and send it back home. How the hell is that helping our economy if it's spent elsewhere? Uh, so what are your initial thoughts on that? That's really a great point. Um, and what he's talking about is remittances um, that are sent. So you have um, immigrants who come here, um, economic migrants, and then they send money back home. And what's interesting about this is these remittances um, dwarf whatever financial aid the U.S. government sends uh, countries in the Northern Triangle. I mean, we're talking about money that's sent over in the billions. Um, our financial aid um, that the U.S. government sends over there is just only in the millions. So, I mean, it's dwarfed. Right. And uh, the Trump administration has brought up this point and how I mean, this really is a good incentive for uh, government leaders in Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras to not do anything about the, the immigration situation. Because, I mean, why not? I mean, they have money that's constantly flowing. Um, why give up remittances when it's billions more than uh, the financial aid that the U.S. government sends over? So we do need to solve this mm -hmm. issue. I mean, there are people who've suggested taxing it. I actually think that's a good idea. Because, uh, I mean, this doesn't help our economy. This is the money that they're earning that and they're sending outside of the U.S. economy. Here's here's two key figures I wanted to see what your thoughts were on. The first is the three northern triangle countries of Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras uh, received $17 billion with a B in remittances in 2018. So if you think about that number, and if it was taxed even like 7%, uh, a small number like that, um, think about how much of that money could be spent on, you know, our border security, even to help fund the wall. But it, like you said, it's not taxed at all. So it's just this free roaming number that's going straight back to their home countries. And the other thing is 20% of uh, the economy of Honduras and El Salvador is made up through remittances. So that's one fifth of their economy. That's a but huge how figure. How much? One fifth? One fifth, 20% of Honduras and El Salvador. And that's uh, just an alarming figure. I mean, the fact that it, they're getting so much money that's not getting taxed at all, and they're here oftentimes illegally working in the U.S., I mean, I, th I think that presents a lot of issues here, don't you think, Julia? Yeah, I mean, I, I had no idea that it was that high. But what I'm wondering is, I know I've heard that suggested that we tax our remittances, but have we, is that something that Democrats are going to push back on? I mean, what's the argument, if any, against that? Or are they just going to push back because they don't want to see a change or they don't want to have it fixed? I mean, it seems to me like that would be a pretty uh, nonpartisan like a, a, or a bipartisan sort of agreement that we could come to. Well, I think their argument would be the Democrats would be, well, you know, this money is helping develop the, the host countries in, in, in the Northern Triangle. But it's also developing a dependent relationship on us. Right, you know? exactly. But I, I, I think it's something that I don't know. First off, it's not talked about enough, but these are just huge figures that, again, they should be taxed or they should be, um, you know, regulated more. And it's it just it's not being done at all. Well, I think that's something that our research department's working on right now is a study on remittances and what could be done. So that's something for everyone to stay tuned for in the next coming weeks. Maybe we'll have some more information on that topic. Yeah. So, Julie, I think we have a second question here. We do. So Laura from Pennsylvania asks, shouldn't the globalist thinkers be holding the leaders of these countries responsible for abusing their own people? So, yeah, I think we kind of talked about this briefly before, Jason. But, you know, people like Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, AOC, why aren't they calling out these leaders of these countries. I mean, it's, they're the ones ultimately in charge of the policies that are affecting their people. And you can see basically in these Northern Triangle countries that they're fleeing because of, you know, widespread violence, uh, poor economies. I mean, it's, why can't they hold the leaders of these countries accountable? Right. It doesn't make sense. I've yet to hear Nancy Pelosi or anyone in the House Democratic leadership to openly call on these leaders to do something. I mean, no, no one's been holding them responsible here in this country. Uh, we can have a conversation about USAID and continuing USAID over there. I know uh, Democratic leaders were not in favor of Trump's uh, threat to close off aid. But in the least bit, we can talk about having aid um, coincide with some sort of progress, some sort of, they need to meet some sort of measures uh, to continue receiving USAID, whereas does that have something to do with... Um, them reducing crime, some sort of government stability measures there, something to hold them more accountable because it's obviously we're just sending the money, um, no strings attached, and we're seeing no progress. So do you agree with Trump proposing to cut off the, I think it was $500 million to the Northern Triangle countries in aid? I mean, do you think that's going to do anything, send a message, or do you think that it's really not that big of a deal? I mean, to be honest with you, I do trust um, our 
the, the experts over in the Department of Homeland Security. I know um, Kevin McAleenan, um, he supports continuing USAID. And that's because basically I'd, it would really just make the situation worse. With that said, um, I do think we need to at least tell them that, that there will be strings attached to that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, basically, I don't think uh, the White House can single-handedly um, prevent aid from going over there. Uh, I think there's some legislative um, mm-hmm. things that need to happen. So the fact that if, if he's at least threatening to cut that off, uh, I think that w- that would at least help. You know, there need to be strings attached to this USA, but um, a full, you know, siphoning it off, I don't know if that would, that would as help at all. So going off of that, we're going to conclude with our final segment called The Weekly Number. So in this segment, I'll be selecting a number that I think is really important uh, for the immigration debate this week. And so the number I've chosen is uh, 103,492. Uh, so this number represents the number of apprehensions and admissibles uh, CBP conducted at the southern border last month, which was a historic number for March. Uh, it was more than double than March of last year, and it's the highest in five years. In fact, I'm pretty sure it's even highest in a decade. Uh, so, Jason, what are your initial thoughts on these on these figures, and what can we do about it? Yeah, well, highest in uh, 12 years. So, I mean, it, it, it's pretty crazy. We knew that these sort of numbers would be coming in beforehand. Uh, I believe DHS actually thought we would uh, get close um, to 100,000. Um, they did not expect us to surpass 100,000. So, these are pretty start pretty startling numbers. And, I mean, it just just proved that there is a border crisis going on right now. Uh, The numbers prove it. And you've got um, a number of uh, Democrats um, in in the previous administration who are coming out and saying, yes, this this is a crisis. I mean, when you've got former uh, DHS Secretary Jay Johnson saying, you know, I I don't even know how to to, to, to fathom (laughs) these numbers. I mean, we've got 4,000 reaching the border a day. That is a crisis. And, of course— and this is the case the Trump administration has been making beforehand, it's not just the number, but it's the demographics. I mean, these aren't single male uh, Mexican nationals anymore. I mean, these are c- people from non-contiguous countries. Mm-hmm. I mean, basically, well, we've been talking about the non, um, uh, the Northern Triangle. And that's what's um, just completely stretching our, our resources thin because our laws right now are not suited for family units or mm-hmm. from immigrants from non-contiguous countries. And I think we talked about two weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, about um, the busing systems that have kind of mm-hmm. cropped up uh, where cartels or where traffickers are, are using buses or they're, they're moving people up. They're no longer trekking all the way up on foot. People are getting paying money and getting bussed from uh, below Mexico all the way up through Mexico and just dropped off at the border in these kind of like in-between zones, and then they're being processed for asylum. But the problem that that's creating is that you're not just getting able-bodied people that are able to make that journey on foot. You're getting um, you know older people, sick people, people who are really need our you know our healthcare system. But that's putting a strain on the resources that Border Patrol have. Um, when, when they are, you know, assessing these people and bringing them in, someone who's 80, 80 years old and has an oxygen tank, let's say, mm-hmm. could not have made that journey no, on foot. But by putting them on a bus, you're bringing these people who are desperately looking for help, and they shouldn't be faulted for trying to find a better uh, life. Like, I don't blame that person for, for making this decision to, okay, if I can afford it, I'm going to go. But the problem is, how are we going to process that kind of um, influx coming in of people that – they might need immediate medical treatment and Border Patrol might not be able to administer it in time. You know, you're going to have a real tragedy right. on your hands. And here's the thing is these family units, when they're arriving at the border and you, you see this on video surveillance or just, you know, reporters down there, they're not actually trying to flee many times the Border Patrol. They want to be caught because of how, uh, I guess, exploitable our asylum laws are. And it's something that it's beyond me. You know, you'll see a group of 300, 400 migrants basically just cross the border and wait for the border patrol to apprehend them because they know, you know, after 20 days, if I have a kid um, due to the Flores settlement, we can be released. And, you know, my court date might not be for three or four more years down the road. And, you know, they disappear into the interior of the country. I mean, the only thing that's a huge issue right now is the weak asylum laws. It's, it's the biggest issue right now. Thousands of these uh, foreign nationals that are reaching the border, they're not trying to get in between ports of entry. They're going right to a port of entry, and they're just simply claiming asylum. And this is actually a, a big story that the Daily Caller News Foundation is working on, get something out soon, is that uh, a vast majority of the asylum claims, in a, c- compared to, mm-hmm. to people from other, uh, to other countries, are actually denied. I mean, these are bogus claims. Um, but they know how to game the system. And, I mean, there are people who, who actually visited Guatemala, visited Honduras, and they asked them, you know, 
what are the plans? What's going on? And they'll say word of mouth has spread that if you if you bring a child and you claim asylum, your chances of getting released into the interior of the U.S. Um, rises dramatically. So what do you guys think about President Trump's proposal to move all of these people to sanctuary cities? Yeah, I mean, well, let's face it. I mean, there is a huge influx of, of asylum seekers and migrants coming to the southern border. And a lot of these detention centers are overfilled. I mean, it's to the point where they have to look for alternative sites. I mean, it's out of control right now. Um, now, to use them as political pawns, I mean, that's up for debate. But what I think matters is, you know, they're being placed in locations where there is detention space for them, where they can be held and not be lost into the interior of the country. I mean, once you do that, you're just contributing to the, you know, illegal immigration problem to the country. You have to keep them in check. You have to put them somewhere. And if our detention centers are filled, I mean, this seems like a, a reasonable choice, don't you think? I would, and I'd say if, um, <laughs> you know, it was, it's a very, it was a very Trumpian thing, I mean, for, for the administration to suggest that. And when the news broke, um, you know, the president actually came out and said, well, yeah, absolutely, yeah, I considered this. I'm, I'm trying to push it. Um, it apparently won over Cher. Um, she came out <laughs> at the news of it and said, why would we bring so many illegal immigrants when we have vets and we have people that are homeless? So I think this is just a very Trumpian thing to really just, um, you know, move the debate on yeah, at this. the very least, it's changing the conversation and making them confront the reality of their policies. Well, the, the weird thing is, you know, a lot of these mayors of the sanctuary cities across the nation, you know, they're always saying how they want to keep the, the sanctuary policies intact. Uh, we welcome anyone who uh, resides in, in the United States. But then Trump proposes this and then there's a, a whole freak out. I mean, why offer something? And then now Trump's like, all right, I'll send these uh, asylum seekers to you while they wait for their their court date and now they're you're kind of you know skeptical about that right hypocrisy it, it, typical case of you know not in my backyard exactly um sort of issue but it and there, a lot of them were bringing you know suggesting well i mean why would you why would you bring violence you know over into our cities why would you do this and so well if you think that then then maybe you don't have the same stance uh, on on the illegal immigration debate as you have in public right <laughs> i mean it, it, it's almost laughable how they are treating this like two different situations so going off of these figures again the, the hundred and three thousand. Uh, people that were apprehended or found to be inadmissible at the southern border. Um, would you say Mexico's doing enough? I know Trump almost closed the southern border because Mexico did, wasn't really being as good of a neighbor as it could be. But do you think overall, I guess in the past couple of years, has Mexico been helping enough with the immigration crisis? Are they doing enough? No. Um, will I give AMLO, uh, the new leftist president, some credit? I will. Uh, you, Trump has, well, thanks to the, a lot of uh, pressure from the Trump administration, um, AMLO has um, put forward a few measures to alleviate the situation. I know he's raised uh, the minimum wage in the northern uh, provinces of Mexico. He's also, um, I think, also lowered taxes. He has to try to develop the area, I guess, to try to um, I don't, make the um, his northern provinces in Mexico uh, better. So, but uh, essentially, though, the Mexican government still uh, allows so many migrants from the Northern Triangle to just pass through the country. And I mean, that's really the issue here, and they don't seem to be resolving that. I totally agree. I think that they have shown flashes of potential of being a, a good neighbor and, and helping us with this crisis, but there's a lot more work that can be done. I mean, I think that also they'll be put to the test if the Trump administration gets their way with keeping asylum seekers in Mexico, this new policy they're talking about. I think it was blocked, but now it might go through um, where they'll keep the asylum seekers on the Mexican side until their claim can be processed. Mm -hmm. And that's going to create a big bottleneck in Mexico. If they have to actually keep all those people there, they're not allowed to be released into the interior of the United States. Uh, I think that's going to cause a lot of friction. I, I think so, too. I mean, I uh, I know right now they've probably sent back a couple hundred. It's not that big of a number. I'm not sure if you're familiar with these figures with the MPP. So it's still developing. But I agree. I think that could also cause friction. And, um, you know, we're fortunate that Mexico is taking some people back as they wait for their uh, asylum hearings. What I really would want them to do is to secure its southern border with Guatemala. I mean, I don't know if you've seen pictures of what it looks like, but it's basically nothing. And if they could have some adequate fencing or more border patrol officials down there, uh, I think that would be certainly beneficial to, you know, their own country, but also ours. Right. And I think a migrant caravan just busted through whatever a little rinky-dink wall uh, yeah. they had at the Mexico-Guatemalan border. So, uh, you know, and going back to, uh, you know, USAID, perhaps maybe some of that aid should be going to, to that. Yeah, I, I would totally agree. And I guess I, I saw in the news a couple of days ago that another caravan's coming from Honduras, uh, so I think it's about 1,200 members now, but it's 
again, it's this con continuation of a problem where Mexi Mexican authorities are not really helping out with this problem. All right, Jason, it's been a pleasure speaking with you today. It's always good to get a journalist perspective that isn't, you know, so skewed to the left. But uh, we really appreciate you uh, coming, and I'm sure our listeners uh, love your perspective. For additional podcasts, please check us out on SoundCloud at Fair Federation or our YouTube page. Uh, and tune in next week for an additional episode of Mornings with Matthew.